Yay, thank you. I assume you'll interrupt me if something goes wrong with the audio or visuals. Correct. Okay, okay, great. So, hello everyone. Um, today I'm going to be talking about personality schemas. Um, I don't know if you know me, but I'm the director of TikTok Schemes. We're a little independent studio here in Montreal, Canada. Um, our most recent game was Moon Hunters. Before that, we made Shattered Planet. Um, and before that, I worked at Funcom on MMOs, uh, doing various uh, fun design things. Um, but importantly today, I want to persuade you, uh, at Fox Jam or other things, to generate uh, not just people, but also personalities. And I think this is interesting because not many people are really trying to do it, in my experience. Um, there's a lot of people attempting to generate physical spaces and landscapes and or, or even the visuals of people but i think people are fundamentally more interesting to us uh, than mountains are and so i think there's a lot of room there left to explore for the next uh few hundred years and uh so this presentation uh will go through some of the ways we perceive uh, and understand personalities and then i'll talk about uh, my personal structures when I start thinking about uh, how to construct uh, virtual people. Um, and some people call it AI. I think that is useful for some things, but uh, for this presentation, I'm using the word personalities uh, to differentiate between AI behaviors that aren't necessarily expressive of something we would anthropomorphize um, or call human. Um, now, it's slightly disconcerting for me to just talk at my slides. Uh, can I get a confirmation, like a cheer, that you guys can hear me? I've unleashed the mic, friends, so you can hear me. Then I'll, uh, I'll just continue and hope for the best. <laughs> Should I speak more slowly? Would that help? No. OK. Well. So there's all these things that make up people, and we have been trying to categorize how we understand personalities basically since the recorded history of time. Um, the very first stories were very clearly about personality types rather than actual individuals. Um, it helps you relate to characters when you feel like you can anticipate what they're going to do next, whether they are Gilgamesh or Odysseus or Jesus. Um, it is helpful when a character is consistent in the way that they act, and then we describe this as a personality. Um, even today, it is very popular to try to typify yourself and your friends. Um, even if they are multi-dimensional, complex people, we like to simplify one another. Um, astrology is very popular. Myers-Briggs is very similar to astrology in some ways. Um, and there are many, many ways that we can sort ourselves uh, to make ourselves feel better or more unique. Um, and honestly, we are all unique, um, but by actually choosing what kind of paradigm that you are using when you generate your personalities, um, it will help differentiate between your characters. So if you are generating goddesses, um, it might help you to think about what are the differentiators that humans tend to put between gods and goddesses, or between uh, YouTubers, I guess, if that's what you're generating. Um, and so when you start deciding what kinds of personalities you're going to generate and what your paradigm of personality is, um, I think the number one consideration that you should have, that most people need to land, um, is how the player understands your, your character's personality. Now, in traditional writing, um, I'm trained as a writer, um, background in English literature, and it is a faux pas to tell the player or the reader um, what personality trait someone has. Typically, you write in such a way that a character acts consistently, and then the player forms their own introspective idea of what personality is. Um, there is the classic show, don't tell advice, um, that makes things very satisfying for readers and players. Um, however, 
the ways that these tend to be communicated are, are very surface level. Um, we have instantaneous communication through character design, um, whether it's what we communicate by choosing a character's race, um, gender, age, uh, etc. All of these things, whether they're subverted later or not, communicate something immediately as soon as the player encounters the character. Um, over time, uh, patterns form, and that's how we understand what a personality is of a character, is what they do regularly, what they quote unquote tend to try to do uh, when they are under pressure, um, when they're not under pressure, uh, the different choices of behavior, how we understand what personalities characters have. And so what we, under, what we see is that in games, um, especially games with dynamic content, um, we actually go the other way, is that games tend to be very explicit about what personality trait a character has, the player observes it, and then they form their own opinion about how the system is behaving, um, and they try to anticipate future behavior. And it's interesting, but I feel like part of the reason this happens is because we are insecure about the depth of our systems and how players can perceive it. Because a lot of it is very, very difficult to see. Other than appearance and behavior, um, it is hard for the, the various pulleys and mechanisms that we build into our uh, procedural games to actually be transparent to players. Um, so you'll see in things like, whether it's Crusader Kings or, or Dwarf Fortress or even something as quote unquote simple as The Sims, um, it's very, very upfront about what it's doing and what the various levers are. And so now I'm going to start talking about how I approach the actual implementation of generating personalities. Um, we didn't go down this road very far for Moon Hunters, uh, but we are working on secret things that I can't talk about. So you're getting a little bit of a peek into a window, uh, but I hope that it'll inspire some of you to make a prop jam about uh, the internal workings of people. So the first thing that I hope everyone thinks of when they try to generate a personality is what motivates the person? What do they want to do? because that will generate their behavior, right? Um, so that's everything from I need to go to the bathroom, which isn't very interesting for your personality, um, versus I want to eat, um, but what do you want to eat? Do you want to eat more because you're a glutton, or do you want to eat more because you're depressive? Do you, what does it mean to want to do those things, right? Now, I highly, highly recommend to anybody even slightly interested in personality theories or generation of humans at all to look up the big five. The big five is the dominant psychological model for understanding humans. It is scientifically based. It actually uses measurements like science <laughs> and it measures along the five axes of openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And literally uh, the average human is 50% on the spectrum of all of those five, but of course no human is actually in the middle of all of those five, and that's how we get personality traits. So really, really uh, look it up. Uh, it'll be very inspirational if you're looking for things to base your characters on. Um, now, if you talk to most neuroscientists um, or philosophers, they'll actually say that humans are, are mostly what we know and understand about the world about around us. Um, the experiences we've lived through, um, the stories handed down to us from our parents and our grandparents, um, and what we're instructed to believe are also part of who we are and what we choose to do. Um, and I would add the third dimension, um, which is other humans. Um, I think one human in a vacuum doesn't really have a personality. I think if you are one person, um, unless there are other people around, you are just standing in for all of humanity, and whatever personality you have will not be particularly interesting. Um, maybe that's the writer in me, but I, I think one man shows or one woman shows uh, only have so much depth they can offer. Um, so I'd like to suggest that this is how we look at the implementation of procedural people uh, across games. 
Um, I'm going to step back from my statement uh, a few minutes ago about uh, AI versus personalities and look really quickly at things like Halo, for example. This is why I think that AI is quite different. AI for things like grunts tend to rely more on knowledge, but not much on either of the other two. Uh, they don't really have very strong motivations. They don't really have very strong relationships. Um, and instead, mostly, they are just trying to kill the player and be entertaining and say things, but they don't actually need to know very much, typically. Uh, on the other hand, things like Crusader Kings um, rely very little on knowledge. Uh, AI don't need to know very much. They don't need to understand very much. They mostly need to have interesting relationships with the other AI around them, and they mostly need to have interesting motivations um, to pursue and transparently show that to the players. Um, and so that lends them a depth where a prince might have a motive to assassinate um, a rival, for example. But they don't really need to know very much about the rival in order to do that. I, how am I doing on time? I don't actually have a, a good, uh, how, many, how much time do I have left? Um, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> You got fifteen minutes, but okay. everyone's really enjoying it. So, so take it as, as slow or as quick as you want. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, meanwhile, The Sims, um, in a lot of ways, is a little bit simpler. It doesn't have relationship uh, dynamically across dynasties, um, and has even less positional knowledge of other uh, Sims. But uh, they do have very, very complex needs and personality traits. Uh, where Crusader Kings. Uh, primarily uses personality traits to define uh, virtues and vices. Um, a lot of that is left to the player to interpret how they might act. Um, and a lot of it is, is smoke and mirrors. Uh, the Sims actually makes sure that every single personality trait results in potentially unique outcomes in behaviors across Sims. Uh, when two Sims interact, their personality traits uh, very much change the outcomes of that. Um, and, of course, you can't not mention Dwarf Fortress. I actually asked Tarn uh, to confirm for me whether knowledge was an important thing in Dwarf Fortress, and he said no, um, primarily for computational difficulty. Um, it's very, very difficult to have relationships or knowledge uh, be a strong factor, um, because once you get over a certain number of actors, um, the, the, the amount of calculations you have to do across all of them um, is very difficult. So, similarly to the Sims, actually, if you might notice the triangles are almost identical across the Sims and North Fortress. Under this model, um, the AI are very similar because their needs are their number one, their traits are number two that determine things that they're going to do. For example, a gregarious dwarf is going to seek out the tavern. Um, and then they bias what they do towards their friends, and they want to do violent things towards their enemies. Um, but it's actually very, very similar to the Sims, interestingly. Um, so this is how I understand the way that your procedural personalities are going to affect the player experience. So to me, relationships uh, feed into both a, the, your personalities, motivations, and knowledge. And then what the player experiences is from the bottom up. So when you're thinking about what the player sees, they mostly see what the character looks like, what they do, and hopefully you can kind of show what they can do. Um, but interestingly, the right hand of the uh, diagram is much more opaque, and that's why you don't often see it in games at all. Um, knowledge was actually, I don't know if you noticed, but in all of those games, Knowledge was very underrepresented. Um, no matter what neuroscientists think, um, so far at least, we haven't seen a good model for how to show a human's knowledge to another human very well. Whereas showing their behavior is somewhat uh, easier, showing that they need to uh, eat some food uh, is slightly easier, it seems. Um, but maybe one of you will innovate this weekend and uh, show the world how to communicate one uh, personality's knowledge and how that affects. Uh, what they can do and, and how they act on the world. Um, I mean, I guess it's kind of debatable whether your knowledge, for example, uh, let's say of a satanic cult, uh, changes what you want to do. Is that a motivation, or is it is it really that the knowledge of the cult itself is what changed you and what you do? So, 
Um, I just want to go back to this uh, slide because I think it's very, it, it's basically a list of the easy tools you have. If you want to generate people, these are, this is your paint, your paint set, okay? Um, you have all these different tools where you can paint up different kinds of people um, and then have them change over time, ideally. Uh, if you are aspiring to generate something that even slightly resembles stories, please, please remember that the core of any interesting story is, the, is that the character changes. <laughs> and that would be a whole different talk. We're going to talk about the ways that personalities can change in a way that's natural, um, maybe next time. But for now, um, thinking about where people start off and, and what kind of archetypes you're going for. If you're going for more of a mythical feel, you're going to have a very different set of appearances and behaviors than if you're going for um, Slytherin, for example. Um, so whether you are designing a sniper, their appearance and behavior should be consistent with the personality you're trying to give them. Um, please consider the personality of the character in every aspect of how you interact with them. And uh, don't forget at ever, don't ever forget what the player actually sees, because if it's not fun and it's not interesting to the player to experience, um, then it might have still been useful for you to, uh, to have created it. Um, but I wouldn't call it an experience. I would just call it an, an experiment, um, an R&D uh, project, which is fine. I, I support you in doing that. But uh, please let me know if you do create anything interesting with your procedural personalities, because uh, I would love to play them. And I'm sure all the people around the world would love to play them, too. So thank you. And now we can play. Fantastic. Uh, Tanya, can you hear me by any chance? Yes, I can, but you're very, very um, distant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, can you do impressions? I, I think um, if we've got questions from the stream, that's great. I've sort of, if people, if people want to say hi to Tanya, they can. Um, uh, you, so, are there any questions? Stream. Um, before I want to, um, I mentioned this to Tanya, but uh, I'm sort of halfway through a blog post about moon hunters. But um, I feel like, for whatever reason, no, not many people I talk to who are in procedural generation mention that they've played moon hunters to me or they know what it is. Um, and there's stuff about the way that um, it uses procedural generation that I think is uh, is unique, actually. Um, and I'm hoping that I'm going to finish this blog post about it in the next month because um, I've been meaning to write about it for a while. Um, but uh, really worth looking into. Um, and that's why I'm so excited about this talk and about what Tanya and her uh, studio are going to do next. Any, are there any questions anyone would like to ask Tanya? It's a really awkward setup, so I apologize. You may not hear the questions, but I'll do the best. We can hear you fine, but there's a little bit of the stream right now. Awesome. I mean, no questions on the stream. The stream works. Right. <laughs> sorry, sorry. OK. <laughs> We're going to give like a heart attack. <laughs> So you mentioned that knowledge influence, you, can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Um, you mentioned that knowledge and motives influence behavior through the, uh, sorry, influence uh, can be seen through the things that characters do. And you said that one arm is much easier to do than the other, or much more obvious, or much more um, you focusing on personally in the future. Sorry, maybe I missed the question part. Um, so which of those um, angles, are you focusing more on relationships in the future or knowledge? Um, because I know that you said it's much easier to do one than the other, but I'm curious into which one that you're super, you know, most interested in. Um, so um, I, I think that it's probably easier to get a, a clear result from continuing to explore behavior. I mean, the entire thing is still very, very cutting edge to me. I don't, I don't see a lot of people exploring it. So I'm going to go for the easier branch myself. <laughs> um, but I think it's important to remember that that other branch is there. And it's, it is important to what humans are, even though it's not very uh, outward facing. Um, I think it might be the case that um, novels, for example, are extremely introspective. Um, they almost always tend to be very close to one character, and knowledge becomes a lot more important, and experiences become more important. So if 
you were to make a game that was closer to the experience of reading a novel, then it would make more sense, I think, to take an introspective route. But for me, uh, Kitbox, uh, our secret projects are exploring uh, more extroverted worlds uh, with dozens of characters. Um, for Moon Hunters, we kind of got a little bit sidetracked in procedurally generating a response to player actions um, rather than generating uh, non-player characters or generating uh, personalities of, of the world. And so because in Moon Hunters we limited ourselves to being more responsive, more reactive, um, I started thinking now for future projects about what we can do to be more proactive and from the beginning, before the player puts in any input, making sure that what we've generated is interesting. Um, yeah, that's where we are right now. Excellent. I'm super excited for this uh, project. Oh, no, no, no. Rick, Rick. I think the room is about to explode, but we might have a, a couple of uh, questions from the stream. Um, one of which was um, about the themes of perception and relationships. Have you seen implementations where characters are not just expressing themselves, but games in which people interpret the, the relationships of other characters? So like when characters reason about other relationships, maybe. Um, I think I've got that question right. I mean, I think, um, I forget what, I think the, the word is Kulosha effect. Um, I used to call it constellation theory, where you see some chaos and you, and the human brain wants to see patterns. Um, and I think that's the holy grail that all procedural generation people are trying to, uh, to strive towards, to, to create a bountiful um, something that players can, can project themselves into. And for relationships, uh, that's another thing It's very difficult to actually see for players other than patterns of behavior. I think things like The Sims are actually the closest in Dwarf Fortress um, because you are observing multiple actors over the course of several days or months. Um, I'd be interested to see someone specifically focusing on relationships. I know I didn't get to play much with uh, Versu, I know there are really interesting things going on with relationships, um, and Emily is there, I know, so maybe asking her about that would be uh, an expert on hand. Um, that's probably uh, a wise, um, I, um, I'm, at least the people here will still will be able to ask her questions as well. Um, we've probably got time for one more. Sorry, it's having to go from here to you, to the stream, so the stream can ask, and the stream comes back to us, and then we give you the question. Um, we finished. Well, you can also email me at tanya at kickboxgames.com anytime. People have questions about this on the stream. Um, so someone's just asked where you think the easiest place to start is. Um, if they were going to make something for Proc Jam, they've got like nine days. What's the juicy thing that they could get into right now? Um, well, I, I just saw a prototype um, a couple days ago from somebody who was just trying out that all they were doing was trying to show someone's personality um, as quickly as possible. And she was using um, a, a text editor to try and show uh, with different colors and spacing and, and font sizes and things like that, the, the different spectrum ends of the big five. Um, so at a glance, you could see, oh, it's orange and bold. She must be open to experience and extroverted. Um, I think, I honestly think that fashion is the number one thing that uh, is, you can so quickly start getting into um, personality through appearance that just communicates so quickly to the player. Um, I think a lot of people start with uh, text generation, and that's totally great. I think text text generation is one of the easier ways to start. You're literally telling the player what's going on. Um, if you wanted to use graphics, I, I, think, I think it would be really great to see a whole crop of uh, prototypes messing around with procedural, personality-driven fashion choices. Really great advice. So text and fashion, uh, basically. That's wonderful. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we're going to move on. Thank you so much for going through this. It's like quite early in the morning where you are, I think. Um, one round of applause for Tanya again, please. Thank you. Don't forget to email me. Um, I'm 
Don't forget that you can email me on your at kickboxgames.com if you have questions later. Tanya at kickfoxgames.com. Um, and we're, we've got your Twitter handle up as well, Tanya X Short. Thank you so much, Tanya. We're going to say goodbye. Goodbye.